Absolutely beautiful. You're looking mighty festive today, Shelley. What can I say? I don't know. <laughs> Tell me. I'm in love. I'm in ah, love. Ah, that's what happens. Yes. Your stole turns all kinds of colors, kind of like a mood stole. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> or a mood ring, Todd. Well, I meant, but this yeah. is a stole. So. Mood stole. We're so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're visiting the Cathedral <laughs> of Hope. If you're a member or a regular attender, we just are so glad that you are worshiping with us today. If by chance it is your first Sunday at the Cathedral of Hope, this is what we call first Sundays. In the first Sunday of each month, we kind of take the robes off and go a little more casual and uh, just offer a different worship experience. So we're glad that you're here with us. If it's your first time, please see me in the Ministry and Visitor Center following the service. I have a gift for you just to say that we're glad that you're here with us today. I'd like to remind you to please consult your uh, bulletins this morning. There's a uh, new classes starting uh, on Tuesday. Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Uh, Todd will be teaching the Four Agreements. It's a book, um, and he's memorized this book, <laughs> and it's changed his life in many ways, and he's very excited about it. I never so, assume anything. I take nothing personal. That's right. So, so I try. But he try, and he tries hard, too. Let me tell you, he tries hard. So I encourage you all to sign up for Todd's class. And there's several classes going on. Uh, Catherine is leading up the whole uh, Cathedral's Academy for Life and Learning. And if you look in, I think it's page 10, or uh, is it page 13? Uh, look at all the classes that are going on. Jim's teaching a class on living with chronic, chronic or, or uh, terminal illnesses. Um, in July, Dan Peeler's starting a new class on Bible 101. If I ever want to take a Bible class, it'd be from Dan Peeler. So look at that class in July and several other classes. So I know Dan's pretty good, but Gary Kinley's starting a class, a Bible class on Tuesday nights. He's pretty good. He's too. pretty good yeah, too. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Some of y'all probably already had classes from Reverend Gary Kinley. So. Got a lot of options here. For me, it's going to be really hard to choose. But I well, encourage if you don't come to mind, I won't take it personal. I'll just I know promise you won't. I know you won't. Okay. I appreciate that. Because <laughs> I, I never took it personally when you haven't ever come to any of mine. I prayed at yours one time. <laughs> Once. <laughs> God help us. It is Ministry Appreciation <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> One week from today is the time of every year we, we throw a party, and it's for you. Because the Cathedral of Hope would not be the Cathedral of Hope if it weren't for the volunteers. And volunteer means anything. I know some of you say, oh, well, I'm not in the choir, I'm not in the orchestra, I don't serve at Bach. But I bet you've prayed at home for the Cathedral of Hope. And if you've done that, we invite you to come next Sunday. It's going to be an amazing party. We're going to have a blast. And if you are planning to come, please pick up a free ticket. It's just to help us get a head count. There's no RSVP required, but it helps us know how many people to expect. And to prepare for. And to prepare, because I think you're cooking, aren't you? For the appreciation party? Yeah. Oh, no. If oh, I, no. If I didn't get that call, <laughs> I didn't get that call. You didn't get that memo? Yeah. Okay. We will have food. It's going to be a blast. Anita Hattie and her team have done an amazing job getting ready for next Sunday. And that will be from 5 to 7 here at the church. So what do you say we prepare our hearts for worship and y'all stand and greet one another in the name of our risen Christ? Amen.
Be seated. Today is Promotion Sunday. We're honoring those who are graduating in any way. And I want to ask you, if you're graduating from high school or community college or four-year college or technical school or vocational school, receiving a graduate degree, a certificate in any way, some sort of educational achievement that you set a goal for or you, are, you have now fulfilled this uh, June time of graduations. Can you stand for a moment so that we can appreciate any of our graduating people? Be seated. And we have two people who are graduating from high school from our congregation. I want to invite uh, Yadi and Michael forward, Mike Wright Chapman, and our two high school graduates also, Ryan and Casey. Evan. Casey and Evan, I'm sorry. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good morning, Cathedral. Say it again. Good morning, Cathedral. <laughs> and friends. I'd like to congratulate our high school graduates. It's very important to note a couple of things. Evan has been with us since he was five years old. <laughs> So he grew from the children's ministry to youth, and now we welcome them to the young adults. We also congratulate Casey. <laughs> we have a small token of our appreciation for both of you, and to let you know that this is your home, you're always welcome, this is your family, and that we're here on your next journey. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I welcome you to say something if you like. You don't have to, but you're welcome to. <laughs> I don't. I don't lightly hand the microphone out. So. <laughs> And you don't have to. But you're... All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to college. <laughs> <laughs> I plan on going to El Centro Community College, and then I'll be heading to Midwestern State for a Master's of Fine Arts in Clinical and Counseling Psychology. Yay. So you are a tribute to us, and we are proud of you, and we hope it's a lifetime of learning for you and success. I want to say something before we pray for our graduates about our young adult and youth program. You know, Dan Peeler uh, has done the children's ministry for many years. He continues to do that. Keep him in your prayers. He's been ill this week. And Yadi takes over where Dan leaves off and works with uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers and young adults and Mike Wright Chapman is a new addition to our staff, has been working with Yadi. Mike's a Methodist minister who uh, had been most recently the interim pastor at Cathedral of Hope in Mid-Cities, but brings a lifetime of youth and young adult work in the Methodist Church to us here. And I just want to comment on how there's been an increase in focus and activity uh, this spring that's been tangible. It's part of what's happening at Cathedral of Hope. We don't always see it because it's in the other rooms during the time that we're worshiping, but I want to uh, congratulate the two of you for your hard work, and I hope you feel our support for the programs that they are doing. Okay. You want to introduce the Real Life Connection? Yes. So an important collaboration is we have a GLBT youth teen advocacy group here with us today, Real Live Connections, uh, who are uh, uh, worshiping with us and they'll be, we'll be collaborating with them on an interfaith 
youth-led service on Gay Pride Day in September. But if they're here with real live connection, can you stand so we can recognize you? Ah. Great things. Okay. So let's pray for our graduates. I want to invite you to extend your hands forward, uh, if you like. God, thank you for each of these two young men, for their lives. We are grateful that they're alive and that they have achieved this benchmark of high school graduation, that they're going to college. And we pray for each one of them great things. We pray a strong awareness of how rich the future is for each of them. Bless them now and help them to feel our love and yours and to truly feel in every cell in their bodies, this is beginning, a new beginning, a new chapter to an ongoing life of love, art, career, all the things that await them, God. Help them to feel just a moment in this moment, the richness of their future. Bless each one, God. In the name of Jesus and in the name of everything holy, amen. amen. Mm -hmm. And if you guys, and we'll have just our regular prayers now at this time. So if you join hands where you're seated, and if you prefer not to join hands, that's okay too. This is United Church of Christ, Ultimate Choice Church. So you can fold your hands like this or however you want. Be comfortable in this space and feel the connection of people that you're touching or near and let God be as close as the bodies near us as the hands we're holding. And I'll open in prayer and invite you to pray out loud if you like. For some who have not been here before on a Sunday, but when we pray out loud in this big group, not everyone can hear, we know that. That's okay, it's not about that. It's about naming in the sanctuary, in the holy place, in the presence of people who believe that God does miracles. Let's pray. Holy Mother, Holy Father, bless us this day. Thank you for this glimpse of future that these young people have provided for us. Thank you for all the graduates, their plans, their dreams, their visions. We all commit to making the kind of world that will receive their gifts. We pray now, God, for those who, among us who may be sick or in need of healing in any way, mind, body, spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus, the healer, Jesus, the great physician. So I invite you to name the names of people who are sick or in need of healing in our midst or from our community, near, far, that are important to you. Gary, and for the members of Gary Dinsmore's family, for Brent, anyone in the hospital, in this moment we focus our energy, God, and ask that you touch them in the name of Jesus and bring a, a moment of pure peace and love that sustains them and assures them and assures us. We pray for those who have died, those whom we love but no longer see. I invite you to name the names of people who are on your mind for whatever reason, recently departed or a long time ago, but you're thinking about them right now. So say their names if you like. with sureness of resurrection. We anticipate the day when we will all be together again someday. Comfort those who mourn, God, and assure them of your presence and love and of the power of love that is stronger than death. We pray for our world, wherever there is strife, in Dallas, in our homes, or abroad, where there's war, 
or tension. Help us to be peacemakers, God, in all that we do. Keep us involved and engaged in the ongoing work of peacemaking here, wherever we are, through prayer and action. I invite you to name celebrations or gratitudes that you have in whatever way you might. I know not everyone can hear. It's not about that. Just say the names of people you're grateful for or I'm grateful for this or that. Put it into words. Gather all our hopes and dreams, God. Unite them to all the prayers we offer to you in your many names. Amen. Good morning. Our modern lesson is from a commencement address given by the legendary poet and activist Dr. Maya Angelou at the Holton Arms School in 2011. Dr. Angelou died at her home in Winston-Salem, North Carolina this Wednesday. Her family issued this statement at her passing. Dr. Maya Angelou passed quietly in her home before 8 a.m. Her family is extremely grateful for her ascension that her ascension was not belabored by a loss of acuity or comprehension. We know that she is looking down upon us with love. So hear now these words. My encouragement to you, young women, men and women, is to be a rainbow in the clouds. When you see that you can do that for yourself, you will see that you can be a rainbow in somebody else's cloud. And strangely enough, many people think that they're graduating from this unique, particular school so that they can go on and graduate from another university or college and maybe find that guy who's two inches taller and that girl a couple of inches shorter, get that piece of paper and find a job that pays you a little more than you're worth and buy the three-bedroom house and two and a half children. Some people think that that's what this is all about. It isn't. All of, this is preparation. All of this preparation is so that you'll be a rainbow in somebody's cloud, so that you may light up the path for somebody, somebody who may not look like you, may not call God by the same name, if she or he calls God at all. Being educated is a wonderful condition. It's interesting that there's a past tense to it, educated, I don't think it should be used as past tense. You will continue to be educated all your life. It keeps you young. Well, my brain is at least young. So I would encourage you to see yourselves, each of you, see yourselves as a potential rainbow in someone's cloud. After I had written the inaugural poem for President Clinton, the United Nations asked if I'd write a poem for them, in effect, for the world. Now look at this. I said yes, thank you, absolutely. I always say yes, and I want you to say yes to the good things right away. And then you prepare yourself. You'll find all help all along the way. 
In my case, I said, yes, thank you. And then I go to the rabbi and to the priest and to the imam, and then I go to little children and to old people and to the library, and I prepare myself. But when I was called, first called by the UN, I remembered when the UN was founded in San Francisco, I was 16 years old, about to graduate from high school. I was six foot tall. I was black, even then. <laughs> and I was pregnant and unmarried. I read in the newspaper that translators were being paid an enormous amount of money to work there. I knew I had a penchant for language. It probably came from being mute for so long. I really learned to listen. So I thought if I wasn't six foot tall, black, pregnant, unmarried, and uneducated, I could go in that building. I saw other women go in, and I wept. So imagine 50 years later, the UN asked me to write a poem and come in the building and deliver it. It was only because I had had so many rainbows in my clouds. I could think back and think on some of them whose names I know, some whose names I will never know, and some who were kind to me, some who said good morning to me and said, I believe you can do it, you see? We must confess that we are the true wonders of this world. When it looks like the sun isn't going to shine anymore, then we can say, I am willing to be a rainbow in somebody's cloud. May God bless the hearing of these words. Amen. Amen.
the story of Jesus' ascension to heaven according to the book of Acts. So when they had come together, the disciples asked, Teacher, is this the time when you will restore the sovereignty to Israel? Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the time nor the dates that God has decided, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to all ends of the earth. Having said this, as they were watching, Jesus was lifted up in a cloud and taken from their sight. There were, they were still gazing up toward heaven when two messengers dressed in white suddenly stood by them. They said, you Galileans, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May God bless the hearing of these words. Amen. And right now is the moment, today is the day I've been changed, I've been changed. I have waited for this moment to come, and I won't let it pass me Well, you have a treat in store. Uh, our guest preacher today is Reverend Glenna Shepherd. I've known Glenna for many years. We were both MCC ministers before we were UCC ministers. And uh, we've uh, traveled the world together, literally, taught together in South Africa, sexuality studies. Uh, however, today we're, she comes to us as the pastor of the Decatur United Church of Christ in Decatur, Georgia. And yes, uh, which she was the founding pastor of, I believe, yes, when it was an MCC church, now it's a UCC church. And Glenna, as you'll hear shortly, is an amazing, gifted, dedicated heart teacher who is pastor, preacher, priest, teacher, all of those things combined in one. And so would you welcome to our pulpit here the returning Glenna Shepherd, because I forgot to mention, in 2001 and 2002, she was the director of worship and music here at Cathedral of Hope. So this is a homecoming in every sense as uh, she returns to Cathedral of Hope. We welcome her and welcome her back. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. I love your interim pastor. I hope you do too. He's, you couldn't have found anybody better. Thank you. And thank you, Voices of Hope. This text for today, this Ascension text, is about change. It's not only about change for Jesus, but it's about unimaginable change for human beings, for the church. Today, I also want to congratulate Evan and Casey on your graduation. 
this time of year, I think brings back memories for most of us, of us, doesn't it? Memories of our own graduations and our own passage from one stage of life to another. I remember clearly the day my son Philip graduated from high school. As he went from one phase of his life to another through this marker in American culture that signals promotion to adulthood, except, of course, for money for college and an occasional load of laundry. Um, <laughs> I watched him grow up. I watched things change right before our eyes. And those of us who are parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, know well that the view on this side of the graduation stage is different from the view on the other side of the graduation stage because we can see what's coming next. We know about mistakes that they'll surely have to make, the lessons that they will have to learn, the struggles that always accompany the joys of growing up. Just as Philip's life and his role in our family has changed since that day, so has mine, and that's a good thing. As much as I want to protect him and design plans for his life, like that's going to happen, uh, as much as I wanted him to have mature judgment instead of 18-year-old hormones, I knew then that the tasks of living and working and loving became his. I recently traveled to my hometown where I went to high school, to Knoxville, the one in Tennessee, not the one in Texas. Um, and while I was there, I was there for a funeral, and while I was there, I ran into a woman that I had known in high school. Uh, I'll call her Beverly. That's not her name, but I'll call her that. Beverly was three years older than I, and, are you ready? Still lives with her mother. Seriously. Beverly has never left home. She never went away to college. She never took a job in another state. It was surreal having conversation with Beverly and her 90-year-old mother. Because in some ways, it was just really stunning. In some ways, they haven't changed at all. Their relationship hasn't changed. Their roles in relationship to each other, they communicated as if they were, you know, 18 and 40. It was just really, really bizarre. And so I, I wonder, I wonder, Be Beverly was an amazing pianist in high school, and so I ask about, about her music pursuits, and she kind of left that all behind, gave it up, settled into, well, really, she settled into her mother's life. Her mother's friends were her friends. Her mother's church was her church. She was even a member of her mother's bridge club. And so I wonder... Has Beverly become all that she could be if she had been sent from home or had left home to make a life of her own? Now, I certainly would not come to any conclusion about Beverly's contentment in life, but it's hard not to make observations or to ask questions. Has Beverly even been able to learn how to make decisions for herself? Has she deferred to her mother as children do? What about relationships, friendships, romantic relationships? Has she clearly differentiated herself and her purpose in life from that of her mother? And the one that I think is probably the most sad, have either Beverly or her mother realized the beauty of that special adult-adult relationship that can happen between a parent and their grown-up, independent children? In a word, I really wonder if Beverly has grown up, if she's stretched into her own destiny, developed her own values and her own mission in life. We've heard this morning the reading of the story of Jesus' ascension. We heard this morning the, the version from Acts. Now, it's really interesting because this is only in one of the Gospels. It's only in the Gospel of Luke. But as you probably know, Luke also wrote the book called The Acts of the Apostles. And he tells the story again there. But it's different. The details are different, which just makes you wonder what that's, what that's kind of all about. This is, at its best, this is an odd story. It's odd to our modern scientific worldview. And so we wonder, I hope we wonder, if ascension might mean something other than go up to the sky. I wonder if something else something maybe even more profound, more spiritual, more real for the church and for Jesus took place on that day. 
Some scholars say that this is a story that the church took from the Hebrew scriptures to connect Jesus with the prophets, some of whom also ascended. But it's also a story that is chock full of meaning for the church. Practical meaning, amazing meaning, meaning about change for us even now. We know that Jesus was coming to the close of his post-resurrection time on earth. I imagine that his friends were experiencing a lot of different things. Fear, dread, excitement that he was with them again. Fear that the resurrection might all be a dream. Dread that he would turn around and leave them yet again. But Jesus stays a while with them. He assuages their fears, assures them as he did with Thomas when he said, Here, touch and see. Assures them that he is real and present with them. He continues in these days to pass on his wisdom and show them what the realm of God is about. That the realm of God is about love poured out for those on the margins. It's about hope in the face of hopelessness. It's about justice and freedom from all that is not the law of love. And so the time has come. They experience his embodied self yet one more time. And then it happens. The action is brief, very brief. Jesus commissions them. He declares them witnesses, and he makes them a promise. He promises them that they will be clothed with power from on high. He blesses them, he withdraws from them, and ascends to heaven, leaving them to try to find somewhere in their imagination what God would be like without him, how God would come to them. The ancient story from the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus' ascension recalls, at least most for me, for me, is the story of Elijah and Elisha. I'm sure you remember the story. You remember that Elijah, the prophet, the elderly prophet, was at the end of his life. He was traveling with the younger prophet, his disciple of sorts, Elisha, who was to be his successor. Elijah tried to withdraw from Elisha, tried to be alone at the end of his life, but Elisha would not leave him. Finally, at the banks of the Jordan, Elijah took his mantle, his cloak, and he rolled it up, and he struck the water, and with this action, the water parted so that they could cross over in this act of bold liberation and union with God. The elder Elijah then asked Elisha what he wanted him to do for him before he left the earth. I'm sure you know his reply. Elisha said, give me a double portion of your spirit. That spirit that is so united with God and God's purposes in the world, I want that. And so after Elijah ascended in a whirlwind to the heavens, Elisha picked Elijah's mantle that was left behind. He rolled it up too and invoked God's power. He struck the water, which parted as it had through Elijah. The mantle was passed. The power and presence of God was with Elisha. Word spread that many said that the spirit of Elijah lived on in Elisha. Like Elisha, Jesus has shown his spiritual power, his connection with God to those who followed him. They saw it all. They saw him feed the hungry. They knew how he brought the outcast into the circle of God's grace. They watched as he stepped over, as he transcended barriers of religion and race and gender and age, as he healed and restored, overturned tables when the poor were being exploited. This, all of this, and the power of God that went through him to do all of this was Jesus' spiritual mantle. His manner and touch and the way he attended to people and stood up for those who never dreamt of being treated with dignity. This was Jesus' spiritual mantle. 
and he had every intention of passing it on. He passed it on so that those who knew him could take up his life, continue to incarnate God on this earth, become the body of Christ in each new age. With this ascension story, the gospel story, the story of the life of Jesus has come to completion. And the story of the church has just begun. The time was then for the church, for those who had lived alongside Jesus, to become the body of Christ in the world. And so in the same way that a parent sends a graduating son or daughter into the world, fragile, bold, zealous, timid, excited, fearful, Jesus anoints this unsure, faltering, and yet transformed people as they become God with us. Jesus had taught them, prepared them, shown them the ways to the realm of God, the way of shared power, power to reconcile, to feed and heal, and now he passes to them an inheritance, a spiritual trust with the promise that the spirit that filled Christ would fill them as well. He passes it on so that the world can know this transforming love and abundant life that is new and relevant in every age. In the same way that Beverly's life and relationship with her mother were compromised because the letting go didn't happen, I wonder, would Jesus' remaining with them have kept them and maybe us from being the witnesses that we could be? In the brilliance, brilliance of his light, we may never let our light shine. In the healing of his touch, we may never allow ourselves to channel that spirit and become agents of healing. If Jesus is feeding the hungry, we'd stand in line to be fed rather than offering food to others. I remember hearing an explanation of Jesus' ascension when I was a child. It went something like this. Jesus had to leave or the Spirit couldn't come. Well, the person who said this may have meant that somehow Jesus and the Spirit couldn't occupy the same space at the same time. And in that way, this is certainly an inadequate explanation. But perhaps in another way, it's true. If Jesus had somehow remained physically present, the disciples' eyes would remain on him, and they, and we, may not have been able to fully pick up that mantle and receive the measure of the promised spirit. They saw God in Jesus, and they may have kept it cloistered there in him, not allowing themselves to become bearers of that same spirit, healers of the sick, those who feed the hungry and give themselves to bring justice. They, we, may not have become people of prayer, preachers of the sacred worth of all people, if we could still look to Jesus to say it right and give his attention to the last and the least. But Jesus does leave, and he does promise that that same spirit will clothe them with power. That baptism with the breath and fire of God would flow through them, in them, utterly drenching them with holiness, that same holiness that they witness in Jesus. And as it does, the word of God becomes flesh once again in the church. They and we are Christed, really. We, the church, become the body of Christ in our age. As our children move to a more independent place in life, we send them into the world, believing in them, believing in their gifts and their abilities and in their heart and their soul, and we assure them of our support and our friendship. But we allow them to grow up. 
confident that their experience and their learning will take them where God wants them to go. In a similar way, Jesus blesses the disciples and us. That is, puts trust in us and then remains close, confident, confident. Have you ever thought that Jesus could be confident in you? Confident that we can be faithful, vibrant, compelling witnesses, calling forth God's love and justice in all we do. In Jesus' blessing, he calls us to grow up, to be witnesses and lovers, to be those who give ourselves for the sake of love. Preacher Barbara Lundblad describes an old woodcut print of Jesus' ascension. The print is pretty literal and simple. It portrays an ascending Jesus and the disciples who are right there with their eyes focused towards heaven. But she explains, if you look on the other direction of that print, on the ground that Jesus just left, you'll see his footprints remain on the earth. Perhaps, Dr. Lundblad suggests, the artist simply wanted to add some homey detail. Or, perhaps the footprints are a clue to the legacy that Jesus leaves behind, and that is guidance. He modeled the way for us. A new way to be fully human, united with God, following in the footsteps of Jesus. Oh, my friends, we live in a world, in a nation, that desperately needs those who will take up this new way of being human. We live in a nation where violence often trumps compassion. We live in a time where the 1% not only get richer on, on the backs of the poor, but feel entitled to do so. We can be assured that those footprints that Jesus leaves us will take us to places of suffering and need in our time and commissions us to be the body of Christ for such a time as this. The mantle has been passed. The spirit is promised. The passion is unleashed again as the church becomes the ever new, ever renewing body of Christ. As we see Jesus take that spiritual mantle and give it to us, may we, like Maya Angelou, be eager to say, yes, yes, I'll take it. And we hear her words cheering us on, leaving behind nights of terror and fear. I rise. Into daybreak, that's wonderfully clear. I rise, bringing the gifts my ancestors gave. I rise, I rise, I rise. May it be so, church. Amen.
I'd like to add my words of welcome to those that you've already received this morning. Also to especially welcome those of you who may be worshiping with us for the first time. We'd like to invite you to stop by our ministry center out at the back of the vestibule, meet with Reverend Todd, got a little gift for you. Would like to share with you a little bit more about the life and ministry of our church. Also a reminder to please register your attendance uh, as the ushers are receiving the offering this morning. Well, y'all know why I'm here. <laughs> I'm here to invite you to give with the same generosity with which you have received. But my primary motive here, because you know, of course, that it is our responsibility as members of this body of Christ to support it in all ways, uh, I'd like to extend y'all a special, well, or a special invitation this morning to attend our next uh, town hall meeting, which will be June 21st at 11.30 a.m. here in the sanctuary. Lunch will be served as it has become our tradition. Uh, and the reason I'm issuing this personal invite is this is a particularly important town hall um, to attend because uh, there'll be a lot of different kinds of significant reports to be given. The newly convened finance committee will uh, offer a report, the bylaws committee, the pastoral search committee, and also, of course, a board report. Uh, and this is all important information, and most of it uh, is pointing to the kinds of change that we're reaching for within the context of our church and our future. And we've also been promised a very open and transparent discussion on some important financial decisions that meet, need to be made on behalf of our church. Uh, one in particular is the issue of refinancing our debt uh, with the United Church of Christ. So this is all important information. Um, it points to the stability and foundation of our church and certainly uh, will fill us with hope and expectation and anticipation for the future that we are building for those who will come after us. So come to this meeting and bring a friend that may not be familiar with our church so that they can get an insider's look uh, at our church other than coming to worship, which is a great thing to do. But at these kind of meetings, you learn about the heart of a church. So um, please come and don't forget to give this morning. Who? 
this simple meal sustains us, provides for us, and also shows us our future. This bread and this cup is always available to us. It's the through line that assures us that Jesus, though departed, is still among us. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. This is our comfort. The angel said, Galileans, why do you look up into the heavens? We don't need to look to the heavens. We can look here and here to see the presence of Christ. So I invite you to bless, to consecrate this bread with me and this cup and to repeat after me, this is my body broken for you. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Fill these gifts, this cup and this bread with your life, with your grace, your power. Connect us with you, O oh God. Nourish and nurture us at this table, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. As the lay ministers of worship come forward to prepare a place for you, I remind you that we celebrate an open communion. Everyone is welcome. You don't need membership in our church or any church. We invite you to come and share in these holy gifts of God's grace and love.
can we express our appreciation to the entire music department, the Voices of Hope, the <laughs> Chancel Choir, the orchestra. So you see on the offering, or on the order of worship, it says second offering. Here's where we're at. Our new fiscal year begins August 1st. We are sort of maintaining a balance between expenses and income, and we have a deficit that we would like to see reduced or retired by August 1st. So between now and then, between now and the end of July, we'll be receiving a second offering each week. And here's what I'm asking. Sometimes it'll be for a specific thing. Sometimes it's for the general fund just to narrow that gap so that we end the year in the strongest possible way. We have made such enormous progress this year, I can't even tell you. The fact of all the committees that are now functioning, that there were 18 people in a room looking over bank documents on Saturday to prepare to present to you choices that you can make as a congregation on June 21st in regards to refinancing our loan, uh, if we want to do that or not, because we have options that don't require us to do that. Such progress to have all these eyes and all these people invested in what's happening. Something great is unfolding here, and we need to be in a stronger position as we end the fiscal year. So the second offering, you know, I, uh, here's, <laughs> I know you already give, okay? So I'm asking you to, give above that between now and then if we can each give something so at the early service the earlier service i gave a 20 and i said at the time that i really needed to have it back so i could give it again at this service because <laughs> i really could only afford to do 10 extra dollars uh, uh, at each service uh, that i go to so um, and then shelly matched me with a 20 and i know she's going to do it again <laughs> <laughs> So, I, yeah. I sing on Wednesday night, and I know we're a wild bunch on Wednesday night. I uh, see some of y'all out there. I challenge you. Oh, I didn't ask you yet, but I challenge you <laughs> to give a hundred dollars today. That's what uh, Sylvia and I are going to give if I don't get killed. Hundred dollars. Come on. <laughs> All right, I'll give you another 20. <laughs> it's a minister bankroll, though, a lot of small bills. Oh, wait, a 20. So, we, we do take credit cards. Here's the thing, I know some of you auto-give that through your checkbook or through the credit cards. I know that some of you uh, just really are, are giving to capacity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And let's all stretch so that by the end of Ju uh, July, we are in the strongest, possible financial position that this church has been in in 20 years. I think we can do it. So please give generously right now. Then I am still and wait there in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You will raise me up so I can stand on
<laughs> invite you to uh, <laughs> we invite you to join us in the coffee hour after church uh, for fellowship time. Please be sure to look for someone you've not talked to before to welcome them warmly uh, into your conversations. Let's make the fellowship hall feel as safe and friendly as this room feels in this moment right now. And also, if you're new to the church, come see Todd Scoggins. He'll be in the visitor center. He'll answer any questions you have, tell you a little bit more about the church. We have a welcome gift for you. Come join us there. And come back Wednesday night, 715, for Pulse, where we worship, uh, where we worship next. Beloved, receive the promise of Jesus. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Peace not as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And may the blessing of the Holy One, Goddess, God, Eternal Spirit, remain with us now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>